one of the most impressive and diverse uh, resumes in the history of uh, music, really, is uh, Bob Ezrin. And just to give you a little bit of the framework, producer of Pink Floyd's The Wall, Peter Gabriel's debut album, Kiss Destroyer, uh, classic early albums of Alice Cooper, Rod Stewart, Deep Purple, Jane's Addiction, and most recently working with U2. Uh, Bob Ezrin has been kind enough to pop by the Shome Studios. Good it's my you. great pleasure, legendary Shome. I'm happy to be here. Uh, you established, a, um, you founded a, a charity organization with The Edge uh, in the wake of Hurricane Katrina hmm. uh, and raised quite a bit of funds to help out musicians and uh, schools uh, impacted, um, in particular by that hurricane but the um basically um yeah we went on for when when uh katrina happened um the edge and henry jeskowitz who was the head of uh, gibson musical instruments at the time and i um founded music rising we raised right. in the neighborhood of 10 million dollars we replaced instruments that were lost to 2700 professional musicians from the gulf south and 60 different um, community groups and schools. Um, we were the largest purchaser of Hammond organs in history <laughs> to, to replace the instruments that have been lost in the floods there. But once we did that, oh, and then we, we also created a course of study at Tulane University in the musical cultures of the Gulf South so that even if we're, this were to happen again, that music would never be lost. But um, once that was over, then there was Andrew, and then there was another hurricane, and then there was another disaster, and we found ourselves carrying on. So here we are. Um, you know, it's we started in 2005, and here we are in 23. It's almost 20 years later, and now what we're doing today is we're reacting to the uh, fires in Lahaina, and mm -hmm. obviously we're looking at Florida to see, um, you know, what may be needed from us on the west coast of Florida as a result of the, you know, current storms. But that that's not so much about um, conservation. I've always been a kind of quiet um, background environmental warrior and have mostly done this by supporting other people and their efforts in this, in this uh, sphere. And this is something that Ed and I, when we got together around other things, just talking, you know, we realized this is something that we both shared and that we're both like super passionate about. You, um, you and the Ed spearheaded a, a massive auction back in uh, I think it was December 2021, where you got instruments from oh my goodness, you know, Paul McCartney, uh, Elton John, Green Day, Eddie Vedder. Uh, how successful was that auction? We raised two million dollars. I would say it was pretty successful, and um, and those people were all of them, and particularly the members of U2 who have always stepped up. Um, and, and, you know, really gone above and beyond for us, but they all, they all went way out of their way and they provided us with really important instruments to be able to auction off. We sold the Paul McCartney wings bass, like the actual bass from wings mm -hmm. for the highest price ever paid for a bass guitar in history. And hopefully that'll, that record will stand until we do the next one. Yeah. You know, he's still looking for his first one. I don't know if you saw that. It was, uh, yes, it was I know an article that. in the New York Times and yes. trying to get people all around the world to maybe crowd, uh, uh, I don't know what you'd call that, through social media to see if he can track it down again. Yeah. That's going to be worth a lot of money, whoever yes, it will. holds on yes, to that. Yes, it will. Uh, how did your orbit and that of you two first in intersect? Because I, I know that you worked most recently on the uh, Songs of Surrender uh, album. It, um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, I had met those guys in a variety of different places. I mean, we, we run in similar circles from time to time. Um, but really what sort of cemented it was, um, right after Katrina, they were here in Canada and they were playing in Toronto. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, there was a lunch that was thrown for them. And Michael Cole and I went together to the lunch as their guest. Michael was their promoter and I'm somebody that, you know, I, I sort of knew them, uh, tangentially. And at that lunch, I sat next to the edge and I had been starting up this, this idea for music rising. We didn't have the name yet, 
but um, I sat next to the edge and I just said to him, look, you got to have a whole bunch of instruments you don't play. And um, we're going to do this instrument drive and blah, blah, blah. What, what I was describing was, was so far away from what we ended up with, but it was a beginning. And, and Edge said, um, I can do better than that. I'll call this one and I'll call that one and I'll do this and that. And I said, okay, well, here's my home phone number. Call me and let's talk about it. And I left there thinking, that's the last I'll ever hear from that guy. You know, that it would would have been like the typical rock star sort of, yeah, man, I'm here, yeah, you know, yeah. see you later. Um, and sure enough, that Saturday, I got a phone call at home from Edge. He said, okay, I've talked to this one and this one and this one, and we're going to do this and we're going to do that and we're going to do that. And I said, by we, you know, are you declaring yourself my partner? Because I'm going to hold you to it. Mm-hmm. And he goes, yep. And that was it. We became partners right there on the spot and we've remained so till now so that's how you know and then um we reopened the superdome in new orleans a year after katrina um with a, a pre-game show and that was green day and u2 and that was something that i co-produced um All right the saints are marching yeah right with with the uh, saints are coming saints are coming yeah sorry. with uh, abc and um and so work with the band on that. And then I also work with a band on um, Live at the BBC, a little further on down the line. So we've uh-huh. done a bunch of things together. But this um, last project really was, um, this was an idea that Edge had had. We talked about it once a long time ago. And then I thought it would would have gone away. But he called me up and said, I think we're going to do this. Do you want to come on board? Are you planning to go see them at the Sphere? I really hope I can. Yes. I mean, the scheduling is just, it's diabolical for me at this particular moment, but I'm going to really try. It sounds absolutely spectacular. It's, yeah. I, you know, I the can't wait. The whole construction of the thing is just yes. incredible. Amazing. We would like to take this exhibit to the sphere, actually. That I, would be cool. I was saying that to Ed, you know, if we could do this, you know, what what is a multi-screen film that we have right now, but if we could do it in the sphere, which is complete 360, it's mm-hmm. all around you, and have complete 360 sound and stuff, that would be so dynamic and amazing. And it's only 22 minutes long, so if any of you people who are with the sphere are listening... This could be like, you know, a run up to your, your, whatever your main event is. You could, you could put it up as a, as a prelude. Well, you probably know it's a Montreal company that provided the LED lighting. Yes, I do. So there you go. (laughs) If they're out there listening, there's your end. There you go. Um, Do you stay in touch with Peter Gabriel at all? Yeah. No, I do. And, um, you know, one of the great things about um, being, one of the great things about this part of the business, what I get to do, is that I work so closely with people during the period of time that we're creating something that in many cases we form a kind of lifelong bond. You know, we just become deep friends and we stay friends forever. And that, you know, Peter is one of those people that I, I consider a dear friend and, and he has been for, gosh, when was that record? It's almost it's almost fifty years ago, isn't it? Yeah, nineteen seventy-six. Holy moly! God, you're old. <laughs> you, you knew the answer to that. <laughs> so let me take you back to that time, because that, and I, I, I'm sure you've told the story a, a million times, but you know, I'm trying to imagine Peter Gabriel at that period. He's he spent his entire career to that point, yes, as a front man, but always hiding behind masks and costumes. And now he makes this bold, some would say crazy decision to go out on his own and um, and be and pursue a solo career. So that must have been daunting for him. Uh, did you find it daunting as well? Because you knew. He's putting, no, no. I mean, he's I putting himself in your hands. Well, sure. I mean, I didn't find it daunting. That was my job. You know, the reason that they asked me to do it was because they thought that I could um, help him to find his voice and help him to gain some confidence. It was a very scary thing for him to do. This is like jumping without a net. You yeah. Know? And um, and at that time, um, Peter. You know, Peter's a really interesting character. He. He is a true artist in the sense that he is compelled with an inner fire and a vision for the things that he wants to do that is unrelenting, undeniable, and that he he cannot help but but give into. So he gets an idea he's going to do something, that guy's going to do it. 
But at the same time, he also has a kind of measure of self uh, doubt, you know, on a certain level, a little bit of self examination. And as and, I think all artists do, all artists do. That's what I said. He's a true artist. So, so he was compelled to leave the band to go out and pursue a career as Peter Gabriel. But he was also, you know, you know, uh, I mean, understandably so, a little nervous about this whole thing, about stepping out and being not just the front guy, but the whole guy. Mm -hmm. And so um, they asked me to work with him, and, and we, got, we got along great. And I got him to really, I got him to have a good time, I think, and to loosen up and really enjoy the process and surrounded him with some people who made it as much of a kind of celebration uh, kind of creative party. It was f full of crazy ideas and, and, you know, like who would have thought of a barbershop quartet? For yeah. us, you know, and it only came because Tony Levin used to do barbershop quartet. And we were talking about it and I just went, oh my God, okay, how about we do this one as a barbershop quartet? And he, he set the parts and they all sang it. It was amazing. But stuff like that, you know, which was fun at the time. I think we moved a little too fast for Peter in um in the end you know i think that there were things he wished he'd had a chance to try again and again um and i do have a tendency to sort of barrel through things mm -hmm. kind of my nature and um and i think to this day there are some things about that record that he wishes that he'd had another shot at uh, but on the other hand on the other hand we got salisbury hill thank you very much there you go and drop the mic at the time <laughs> yes. because you know, that is such an essential song, not just in terms of what it represents now, looking back, but at the time, you know, this is his moment of, it's a confessional. Um, he's facing up to his vulnerability here. He's also, it's a, a declaration of ind independence. Were you cognizant at the time as you're recording it going, this is an important song. We got to oh, get this hell one yes. right. Oh yes, absolutely, one hundred percent. And it, and we had a uh, a catchphrase at the end. The, the last line of the chorus was not what it ended up being, and and it didn't do the song justice. It wasn't it, it it wasn't living up to the promise of the song. I was completely aware of what that song needed to be, and um, and so I just said no, no. Nope, we're not we're not going to we're not putting this song out with that last line. And and that went on for quite a while. There was a you know, it became a joke almost. We tried everything you could think of for the last line. And then one day while we were in New York during mixing, Peter says, "Grab your things. I've come to take you home." And I went, "Bingo. That's it. We got it. Let's put up a mic and let's sing." And he sang that vocal um live you know right there on the spot because we had cracked it um how you first uh, became aware of him that's a famous story you've shared that a few times you saw uh genesis at massey hall who were on a bill with one of the strangest combinations other than Jimi hendrix opening for the monkeys on tour uh <laughs> it was genesis opening for Lou Reed. Yes. And that was the first time that you saw Peter Gabriel. Um, do you know who else was in attendance that night? You probably know the answer to this. No, I don't. Daniel, can you play the clip for us? Here's Getty Lee. I went Lee. to see a strange double bill. Genesis <laughs> was opening for Lou Reed. Ooh. Yeah, and it was Genesis' first time in Toronto. And they started with Watcher of the Skies. And uh, they were great, I mean. And then Lou Reed started playing afterwards. And, you know, you like Genesis, not so much Lou Reed yeah. at that yeah. period. Yeah. You know, nothing against Lou Reed, but it just wasn't an act he could follow. So we left. <laughs> Wrong, Getty. Wrong. I'll Lou was, I'll tell you that. what. Yeah, he's like he totally missed the plot. You know, but but we're Canadians and and it's hard for us to understand dangerous. Dangerous doesn't come naturally to us uh, unless we're on the a, ice. In a soft seater like Massey Hall. Yeah, too. in a soft seater like Massey Hall, but but Lou Reed was danger on stage, man. He was he was just there was there was something on the edge about that guy that night and and magical. He was he was powerful. He to me, 
he looked like he was about to erupt, and he never did. Mm. So I'd gone to see him because they asked me to produce him. So that's why I was at the show. And I wanted to see Genesis beforehand because I'd heard them on the radio in Toronto, a different station that will remain unnamed. Um, oh, yeah, it could be. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and, and I just loved what I'd heard on the radio. Uh, so I wanted to see them. And, and I, I did say to Lou's manager, which is probably the wrong thing to say, that during this show, during the Genesis set, I went, you know, give me that kid with the flower on his head. <laughs> I want to work with him. I do stop, but, but I do want to work with Lou. You know, do, don't misunderstand. Anyway, Lou was amazing. And, and watching that show was the impetus for me to go on and do Berlin with him. As somebody who has been in the production world for as many decades as you have, I I have to ask you about um, your opinion of things like AI, for example, which is starting to be utilized, um, and all the other various uh, technological advances um, that become available to production. Now, AI in particular is a very controversial topic, especially yeah. since... Uh, it depends on how it's used, obviously, in the same way that, that you know nuclear energy depends on how it's used. Mm -hmm. There are peaceful and wonderful and creative applications of AI, but then there are also... Uh, there's also extreme fakery and um, and appropriation of other people's work, of other people's styles, of other people's thoughts and, and creations, and that I worry about that a little bit. I you know I heard a, a Drake and Weekend duet. I'm sure you heard the same thing when it came out, and I thought you know I heard this thing and I I didn't know it was AI at first, and I thought this is this ain't that great. You know it's okay, but I'm quite surprised that they would have put this out. And then, of course, I read the, the little bump behind it, and it said, oh, this is AI. Um, and that was, a, that was an informative moment for me, because this is what can happen, is that you can create facsimiles of things, but facsimiles will never have the soul, never have the depth, the heart, and, um, and the sense of... There's an underlying sense in all humans of morality, humanity, and one's position in the world, right? We mm. all have a sort of sense of self. AI has no sense of self. It doesn't know what it is. It's just a, a thing that you can, you can aim at a particular task, and it will take that task on in a completely selfless and, um, and literal way. And... I can't think of any other art that would be created that way. I can't think of any art that I've ever seen or been a part of that was created in a selfless, uh, literal, you know, completely devoid of, of morality, philosophy, sense of purpose way. And also devoid of accident. And, and to me, that is one of the great um, fuels to creativity is yeah. accidents things that that are not planned um you know they they can they can even be little errors that are made in the recording that sometimes make the difference of it of it being something magical yeah well that's that is true too accidents are an uh, an important part of the process that's for sure and um um yeah i mean there's a whole list of reasons why i would prefer to just have people um, control their own output, but 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 then in the hands of really creative people, AI can can be used to do things right, really important things. Well, we saw its use on um, uh, the Get Back documentary, and you know that was amazing. Uh, yeah, we never would have heard that conversation between John Lennon and Paul McCartney over the 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 flower pot <laughs> yes. in the cafeteria, yes. were it not for AI. So. Yeah, it's true. So you know, in the in the hands of very creative people, as a tool, it's amazing. As a replacement. Not so much. As a replacement on any level, as a replacement for real interviews, as a replacement for, uh, you know, f for personal appearances, as, you know, as a replacement of, you know, for writing one's own philosophy or living according to one's own principles, it's a dangerous thing. I just want to play one more clip, which unfortunately was on a cassette, so I wasn't able to digitize it. Um, so I just recorded it on my phone. And this was, well, we haven't figured out the date, whether it was probably December 1979. And then uh -huh. his wife, Carol, used to work for me in London. And we've known each other for...
for a long time. And this was a monumental undertaking that he was embarking on. It was not just a double re- double album, but a huge stage show and, uh, and a film and all kinds of other things. And it was too much work for one guy. And he said, I'm not going to do it unless I have a collaborator. And he had a list of uh, possible producers based on work that he'd heard and so on. But I was at the top of the list because at least he knew me. And that, you know, as you would well understand, they're very private people, these guys. And mm-hmm. They're not particularly confident with strangers and so on, and they don't really like the idea of letting someone in on the inside. But I, I sort of have an inside track there. So, uh, in fact, when Roger and I first discussed doing this, I was in England with, with my kids, and we were holidaying, and it was just a social phone call. And uh, he invited us out to the country to fool around for a day and listen to this demo that he was doing at home on this new album idea he had. You know? And that's kind of the way it started. That's a 15-year-old Bob Ezra. <laughs> oh, my. So did Roger Waters' wife work in your office? Carolyn, before she married Roger, um, was our... Well, at, before us, she worked for um, WEA. She worked for Atlantic Records in okay. in London. And, um, and then uh, with Warner Brothers as well, and worked with Alice Cooper when we were over there. And then I suggested to my partners at Nimbus that um, we're doing all this stuff. People really like us over there. We should have an office. We should have at least a representative to sort of promote the company over there and get us more European work and stuff. So I asked if she would be interested in taking the job on. She worked for us for a period of time. And and then she started dating Roger. And uh, I met him at her house, as he, as one does, you know. And um, the rest is history. A concept that was born... Or the rest is her story. (laughs) A concept that was born also right here in Montreal after their final concert on the the Flush Tour. Yeah. Um, Yeah. I'm not... Yeah. I'm not sure whether it was actually born or whether it was cemented at the Mm. time. I think that there was already... Because we'd had conversations in Hamilton... Ontario, I went to the show in Hamilton, which I think was before the Montreal show. Yeah, Montreal was the very last show of the tour, yeah. And Hamilton was where they blew up the scoreboard (laughs) in Ivor Wynn Stadium. Yeah, not intentionally, I can tell you. But um, uh, yeah, but I mean, in the car on our way out to the show, he had talked about a sense of of alienation and disaffection. Not disaffection, it's not not the right word, but alienation and separation from the audience. And also sometimes feeling like the audience were giving too much adoration and too much attention back to to him and the band. And that, you know, after all, they were just rock and roll guys and not, you know, religious leaders or something like that. But there was a feeling that sometimes... He almost wished there was a wall between Mm -hmm. him and them. And that's, that's what I heard anyway, in the fog, in the fog of time. That's my recollection of that conversation. And do you stay in touch with Roger? Yeah. No, not at all. eh? No. Um, sadly, no, because, um, you know, part of me really loves the guy and Mm -hmm. I, and I really loved working with him. We had a falling out at the end of the wall as a result of my, you know, basically my stupidity um, and naivety at the time. But um, but then we made up and we talked about doing uh, his solo work together with. But it was just so difficult to um, coordinate schedules and to you know sort of you know to work within the parameters that he was setting, and I finally. uh, I finally just had to say, no, I can't do it. You know, mm. I've got five kids and two dogs, and we're, we we can't pick up and go to England for however many months it's going to take to make this record. So I'm really, really sorry. And then literally a couple of weeks later, I got a call from David Gilmore saying, well, and Roger had said to me, the band's over. Like, I quit, and the band is finished. So I thought that was it. And then David Gilmore called me a couple of weeks after that and said, well, Roger's left the band, but he doesn't get to decide on when I retire. Mm. So we're going to make another album, and we'd quite like it if you would, you know, if you'd come and work with us. And But he said right off the bat, look, you've got a family, I've got a family, let's work it out so, you know, we'll do part of it here, we'll do part of it there, we'll make it so that it's, you know, it's livable for both of us. And that was just such a difference. And um, so, and and... 
you know, where I had to go to Roger to meet with him and, and listen to music, David said, okay, I'll fly out to LA. I've got some songs I'd like to play you. You know, it was just a difference in, in approach. And, and it just felt more, um, it just felt more human and, um, and more livable a situation. So I ended up going with the other guys and that really pissed Roger off. Yeah, I'm sure. That was like, because in his head, we knew, we'd known all along we were going to do this and we set him up, which yeah. is not at all true. We had no idea. There was no setup. It wasn't, we weren't trying to hurt him or anything. Um, but that's what he thought. And then we've, you know, we've met along the way a couple of times. Um, we've tried to, you know, mend the relationship. But it, lately, in in Roger's um, stances about um, Israel and the Ukraine and some just some other stuff, like I'm both Jewish and my people come from Lviv and and from Kiev. Oh, I didn't and realize originally. That. Well, you have that in common then with uh, Edward, with Bertinsky. Of yeah. course, I do. You know, but but you know, to listen to some of the crap that Roger spews and and look, I you know, I don't happen to agree with with the policies of Israel when it comes to the Palestinians, um, but I do understand how we got here, and mm -hmm. I do understand that it's a, that it's an existential issue for both sides, and that it has to be addressed. And, and that the answer to it is not to isolate or or eliminate one or the other. And it's certainly not to demonize one side or the other. You know, it's certainly not helpful to fly a pig with a swastika, mm -hmm. a, a, a Jewish star, and and a phrase that says, show me the money in your concerts. And to, and to wear this, you know, what... What was anti-fascist regalia exactly. in the making of the wall mm -hmm. has now turned into becoming symbolic to the fascists of the world, who are looking at it and saying, "Yo, go, Raj! You know those, you know those Jews will not replace us," and that sort of stuff. And I can't abide by it. Mm -hmm. As much as I love him, and as much as he, you know, he, he the, he's a great artist, but. You know, Wagner was a great artist. He wasn't a really, <laughs> wasn't a really great guy. And um, and Roger, I should Ezra say, Pound too. So. And Ezra Pound, right? And you know, I don't, I don't mean that Roger's not a good person. I think I think you know there is the theory of the better man. We all see ourselves as better people than maybe we really are. I got a chance to fly over and interview David Gilmore in his home in Brighton. And so I got kind of a, a sense of that, uh, the difference in the personalities. You know, I met Polly and uh, yeah. we, we talked about her new novel and, uh, you know, served us tea. And yeah, it, it was it was a completely different experience. So, yeah, um, not as not as difficult as Roger can be. And he's not always that way. I mean, we used to go to McDonald's with his kids when we were working on the wall. You know, mm -hmm. he was fun to hang out with. He had a great sense of humor. But um where he's come now, um, this this stance that he's taking, and he's taking it so angrily and so, you know, virulently, he says he's not an anti-Semite. He'll swear by it. And I actually saw an interview where he was kind of in tears saying, I, you know, I'm not an anti-Semite or anything. But, but the thing is that um, he doesn't get to define what anti-Semitism is. It's the people on the other side of it yeah. that get to say, this is hurtful. This is this is taking me down as a people, mm -hmm. and um, and I perceive it as such. And so, like whether it is or not, if it walks like a duck and it quacks like a duck, it might as well be a duck. And so that's it. That's the end of rant. Um, before I let you go, I would like to give a bit of love to uh, Jack Richardson. Um, oh, please, yes. For for people who who. You know, and a lot of people today probably don't appreciate how significant he was in the history of the Canadian music industry. You know, here's a fellow from Toronto. Uh, he's working for a television production company. He decides, hmm, this rock thing, it could could be something here. You know, and one thing leads to another. He begins Nimbus Records, Nimbus 9, um, signs the Guess Who, puts out These Eyes, American Woman, um really put 
Canada on the map. And then, you know, uh, connected to that, you've got Joni Mitchell and Leonard Cohen and Neil Young also starting to make a name for Canada. But, you know, Canada in particular to the Toronto music scene became really cool. And a lot of that had to do with Jack Richardson. Yeah, Jack, I think, is the most important com uh, uh, producer of... I was almost going to say composer. No, he's not. He he probably would have been great at that too. But he's the most important producer uh, that the Canadian music industry has ever seen, and 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 not just because he made some of these um, amazing records, which were worldwide hits, which took a band from Winnipeg and made it the number one. Careful, band. careful. I'm from Winnipeg. No, so. no. I'm just saying. <laughs> I'm just saying. A band from Winnipeg and made it the number one band in the entire world. People looked up and went, where's that? Yeah. It's Canada. Yeah. That's where it is. It's in Canada where people play real rock music. Right. And, um, and uh, you know, but he was also a very generous man with the knowledge that he had. And um, he saw something in me, took me under his wing, and literally gave me this life that I've been privileged to have for all of this time by believing in me, by taking the time to teach me, and, um, and by standing, standing up for me. You know, when Alice Cooper came along, I, I wanted to do it. The, the company didn't want to do it. Uh -huh. And it's a story I've told many times. But when Max when, is Kansas City. Yeah, Max is Kansas City. And, yeah. then, and, and I made such a case for it that Jack finally said, okay, if you feel so strongly about it, you do it. What, what did you see in them, though? Because, you know, they'd already had a couple of albums and it, it wasn't working. What was it that night that you saw that went, yeah, this could be different. This They got something here. Well, you know, I walked into Max's Kansas City. I sort of stepped over the threshold from the real world into a Hieronymus Bosch painting, you know, and where yeah, everything, yeah. It, everybody in there was like black. some kind of a demon. Yeah. <laughs> they all had ghost white faces and black hair and jet black lips and black fingernails. They all kind of floated across the floor. It was like the Night of the Living Dead, you know, and right. and, and, I, and I was there with Alan Nichols, another CBC baby like me, and, and we were these two Canadian hippies, eh? We're like, oh my God, this is kind of weird, eh? Oh, so they set us up at a table right in front of the stage, and the band comes on. There's a light show. There's props. There's sets. There, they, the the audience knew every lyric, like every word of every song, and these were things that hadn't been released yet. Hmm. And the music was good. I thought the music was really powerful. It just was unfocused. It was kind of all over the place a little bit, and. Um, and, you know, I need a little of this or a little bit of that in my very, very uh, junior opinion. You know, you're, you're what, like 25? At I this was point? A, no, I was 20. I was a baby. I knew amazing. I knew amazing. nothing. But I but I had a feeling. And when I went back to Toronto to talk to Jack, the, the reason I got the gig was because I said to him, this is not rock and roll. I, you know, I talked to save my life. I go, this is not rock and roll. There were no T-shirts. There were no jeans. There were sets and lights and props. And everybody knew all the words. They all did spider eyes and spandex and blah, blah, blah. And he says, enough already. You know, if you like it so much, you you know. And the other thing that I said was that it, it's not rock and roll. It's the beginning of a cultural movement. I wanted to ask you that, whether, you, what whether I you were aware of that. Yes. That this was the advance guard of something that was going to yes, revolutionize Yes, because I had music. never seen anything like it. But I knew that all those other people that were in there, they weren't paid extras. Mm -hmm. You know, this this was a subset of society in New York. And they, they had discovered Alice Cooper. And so um, I just knew that it, this was going to be important. And Jack stood by me because God knows Warner Brothers is like, Bob, who? <laughs> We're going to give money to who? And Jack said, no, I'll, I'll do it, but, uh, but he's doing it with me. And Jack stood up. He let me do the, the project and, and did block and tackle for me for, you know, and, and, um, and we ended up having I'm 18, which was Alice's first hit record. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time. I know you're running My off pleasure. to the airport. Uh, it was it was a thrill to sit down and, and talk about not only the span of your career, but also uh, the art of being a producer. And I, I could talk for hours about that. We don't have the time, but uh, I really appreciate having the opportunity to have this one-on-one. -on -one. No, My pleasure. I'm very happy to be here. Thank you. Thank you, Bob.